This is Ralph Rensler, director of the Smithsonian Bicentennial Folklife Festival. If you enjoyed the festival, you'll be interested in this invitation. Ladies and gentlemen, an opportunity like this cannot be taken for granted. This evening, we are going to be beating our hearts out for you all, so I want to see people enjoying themselves. So get up and feel the music and do something about it, okay? This event is a right of cultural democracy. We have many, many partners, you included. I encourage you to stand alongside with us as we travel this journey year after year. Hello, welcome to the 2022 Smithsonian Folklife Festival. For over 50 years, the festival has convened people on the National Mall to explore the power of culture and creativity in our lives today. This year, we feature artists and partners from the United Arab Emirates and Earth Optimism, a global conservation movement. The Smithsonian Folklife Festival is produced by the Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage in partnership with the National Park Service. The festival strives to maintain an accessible and inclusive environment for visitors of all abilities. If you are in need of accessible seating options or assistive listening during this presentation, please see our venue manager volunteer. The Earth, Light, the Earth Optimism by Folklife sponsoring partners include Ford Motor Company, HHMI Tangled Bank Studios, Roger W. Sant, and the Honorable Doris Matsui, and United Airlines. Additional support is provided by the Asian Pacific Initiative Pool, the Anelli Kohole Foundation, Anna Kaiser, Doug Lapp, Rewild, Sakaruna Foundation, and the Shared Earth Foundation. Festival hours are 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. with special evening events starting at 6.30 p.m. on the main stage. For, most, for the most up-to-date schedule information, please visit our website at festival.si.edu. And you can also find all of our speaker bios and more information on all of them and their organizations on our website as well, so please check that out. And also please be sure to visit our marketplace, which is located across the street on the far side of the Smithsonian Castle where you can support artisans from around the world. Also, we encourage you to visit um, the Earth Optimism Concessions and uh, grab a quick snack. There's some great stuff over there. So now I would like to introduce our panel. You are here for Tech Breakthroughs for Animals and Communities. And we're going to start our session today with a unique opportunity. We have joining us virtually Rita Braver, a correspondent for the CBS News. And she's going to be starting a conversation with our moderator, Jared Staubach, uh, ecologist with the Smithsonian Conservation Biology. When they uh, finish their conversation, we're going to welcome the rest of our panel. We have joining us today Gustavo De Lucio, Director of America's Region Iridium. Uh, and then uh, will be joining us online Jess Lefcourt, Director of Earth Ranger. And then we have Dr. Tanya Harrison, Director of Strategic Science Initiatives, Planet Labs, PBC. And, and at the very end there, we've got Jason Holmberg, Executive Director of WildMe.org. All right, thank you for joining us. Rita, Jared, take it away. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. I think there are quite a few people watching this online, I hope. So like me, I hope your technology is working. And I know uh, Jared's going to be talking about technology a little bit. Um, 
Those of you who are coming to this session are probably aware that uh, Jared is one of the leading scientists in the world working on using technology to track um, how animals exist or are not existing so well. So I guess, Jared, I want to start by asking if you could tell us a little bit about how you got interested in animals and in this aspect of trying to protect animals in particular. Yeah, thanks, Rita. Um, I guess my love of animals started from a very early age. Um, I can always remember just even just rummaging around my backyard, picking up whatever I could find, frogs, salamanders. I would always, I guess, not necessarily consider myself a collector. Um, I was always someone that would pick things up, was just super excited about what I would see, but then also wanted to return them to where I found them. And it wasn't until basically going back to graduate school and starting to research things like remote sensing technologies that I started to learn about satellites and GPS tracking collars and camera traps, basically things that allow us to learn about our planet and about how all these animals are responding to the changes that we're observing across our planet. Can I ask you, because a lot of little children are interested in animals and their parents kind of think it's, think it's a passing phase. What encouraged you and what gave you the confidence to say, I, I could do this with my life. I could make this my work as well as something that I just think is a little child is fun. Um, well, I, I guess, to be honest, there's a lot of things that I didn't realize I could make a career out of this when I was probably this, the same age of the people you're talking about. Um, I think the important thing is that we're able to showcase our, our panelists and myself that have made a career out of doing these things. Um, and that there, there, are, there is a career for, for all of us. And so I'm lucky enough that I'm working on something that I'm really passionate about. Um, and I have been able to, I think, make 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 a difference um, with some of the projects that we've worked on globally. Um, I know you're going to talk a little bit more about some of the projects that you have worked on, but in, in the general sense, a, a lot is being said these days about, oh, we can't use technology to cure all of our problems. There's too much reliance on technology. Why do you think that maybe in your field that's a little bit different? I guess from my own experience, what I've seen over, over my career is dramatic improvements in our ability um, to use technology to save species. Um, when I think about the animals we're able to track, there's now devices that are as small, small enough that we can track a dragonfly. And in some other cases, that are large enough or robust enough that we're tracking blue whale. You know, so basically, the whole spectrum of species, we now have at least some information about what they're doing throughout their life cycle. And there's other technologies using artificial intelligence and high resolution satellites that we're actually now able to count large mammals from space. So animals like elephants and giraffe and beluga whales. I think probably the important thing to highlight is technology is simply a tool, and it's a tool that provides us with information. And it really comes down to what we as a global community do with that, that information that's really going to make a difference to addressing what are really um, huge challenges like global climate change or rapid biodiversity loss. Um, and that, in a way, is, brings me right to my next question, which is, is there one thing that you can tell us about where you can say, hey, we use technology to track this problem and we came up with a solution, something that helps. Is there anything where you have seen your work demonstrably make a difference? I guess the, the thing that really comes to mind is the work that we're doing with the Giraffe Conservation Foundation, um, the tallest animal on the planet. And other than about 10 years ago, we knew next to nothing about the habitats that these animals are using, how much they are moving. Um, so how do you design strategies to conserve them if you really know very little about their movement ecology? And so this meant really leaning on tech experts, you know, designing a device that actually could be fit to the animal and provide information about where this animal was going throughout its lifetime. And you know, these, these little devices, they weigh about 65 grams. 
Um, we're attaching them to the ears and in some cases to the acicone of these giraffe, opening up a whole, whole new world for us to understand what these animals need. Have you, is there something that you have found that they need that you've been able to provide now? Or is that still to come? It's, it's more, I guess, that we're understanding their space use, you know, so we can start to work with local government officials. We can start to evaluate how large a protected area actually needs to be to provide the resources that these animals actually need to survive. Well, I could talk to you for another 45 minutes myself, but I know you're about to lead the discussion. So I just thank everybody for giving me this chance to talk to this great scientist and, uh, Good luck with the rest of the panel. Jared, it's all yours. Thanks, Rita, very much. So as Rebecca first highlighted, we have four experts in, our, in, in a variety of fields. And so we're going to be talking about global communication networks with Gustavo De Lucio, um, who's from Iridium. Um, Jess Lefcourt is joining us remotely, but Jess runs an organization called Earth Ranger which is a, a software program that's used to better protect wildlife and the species. Um, we have, again, Dr. Tanya Harrison, who's gonna talk up to us about the latest generation of optical remote sensing. And then we have Jason Holmberg, and Jason's gonna talk about, to us about wild me and the use of artificial intelligence for counting animals like giraffe and whale sharks. So improving our ability to count the abundance and distribution of animals globally. So the first thing that I would like to do is simply have each of our panelists, starting with Gustavo, basically just go around the, the horn, so to speak, and just introduce themselves and give us a little bit of information about the organization. Thank you, Jared. Appreciate the invitation to participate in this distinguished panel um, and tell our story and how we contribute towards this interesting um, endeavor here. Uh, Iridium is a global satellite telecommunications company. We own and operate 66 low Earth orbit satellites, which hover above, eight, er, above Earth at around 500 miles above Earth. Uh, we provide voice and two-way data communications across many different industries. And that enables us to, to focus on providing safety services um, in the aviation industry as well as the maritime industry. In order for us to get certified by the FAA to provide communication safety services for commercial in, in the cockpit and also on maritime vessels, you have to get certified by very stringent processes. And the reason why we're able to do that is because our constellation and our network is so, so redundant and it's so robust and is able to be so resilient to be able to provide critical communications in those particular markets. Uh, and I think that speaks to the ability to be able to communicate in very, very critical situations. We offer services in the maritime industry, large vessels, small vessels, aviation, commercial aviation, private aviation, and also for personal communications. Um, a couple of you know, world-renowned uh, world names and brands that are known to a lot of people, Honeywell in the aviation industry, as well as Garmin for personal communications are two good examples of what Iridium is used for. Thanks, Gustavo. There's a number of things that we're going to return to there. Um, but first thing, Jess, how about we pan to you and have you give a short introduction? Hi, everyone. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, but as the world is right now, I'm in quarantine about a mile away. So, uh, But it's good to be with you anyway, and thanks for having me, Jared. Um, so I, I am the director of Earth Ranger, which is a real-time monitoring and historical analysis software product from the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence. And Earth Ranger works by integrating with every type of data that we can get our hands on from everywhere that we can get it, whether that's from devices that track vehicles or perhaps radios that are carried by rangers or aircraft or cameras or microphones or sensors on fences. And then of course also um, tracking devices like Jared was talking about on animals. And we pull all of these data back into Earth Ranger into one place so that from one system in one view, there can be a complete picture of everything that's going on within an area of interest 
that then allows the uh, protected areas and conservationists to better monitor wildlife in protected areas and make better informed decisions for their safekeeping, whether that's in um, real time and reactive or proactively in planning for the future. Thanks, Jess. Um, Tanya? Hi, everyone. Uh, so I work for a company called Planet, and we operate the largest fleet of Earth observation satellites in human history. So we have about 200 satellites that orbit the world, and they act like a giant line scanner. So essentially, anytime we're flying over land, the satellites are on. And so we're collecting this daily scan of the entire landmass of the Earth at three to five meter resolution. So we can actually monitor ecosystems changing in almost real time. And uh, it's just a really fantastic data set to be able to actually monitor things at the speed of change so instead of kind of a traditional mapping approach that we've had before when we've been doing imaging of Earth for the last few decades from space, um, as well as just having data there proactively. So instead of seeing that an event has happened somewhere, like there's some kind of ecosystem damage, and then going to take a look at it after the fact, we can now watch this over time proactively and see how these things are being impacted. Um, so it's a really amazing tool to be able to use. And uh, I'm a geologist by training, so I, I specialize in areas where we don't have a ton of animals. So it's been really educational for me to see the ways that we can study animal habitats and migration patterns and things like that by looking at these data sets. Thanks, Tanya. And lastly, Jason. Hi, thanks for the opportunity to be here. Uh, my name is Jason Holmberg. I'm the executive director of a nonprofit organization called Wild Me. Wild Me is very different than you might think of a traditional nonprofit. If you think of us as a software startup, we're mostly software engineers and machine learning engineers. But as a nonprofit, our focus is on enabling wildlife researchers across the globe to study and count animals using just really good data management, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. Um, the world of conservation technology is kind of fragmented. You have a lot of very inventive individuals studying their local species in the field and coming up with these genius level solutions, but not well supported by technology in the long term. And then on the other side, you have academia, um, a lot of original research in machine learning and biology coming out of different institutions. What's kind of missing is my team, the engineers in the middle that take technology and make it usable for more than just one researcher, but for teams of researchers for multiple species across the globe, and then support that year after year, advance it, add new machine learning, and make sure that each of these different researchers in the field have the opportunity and the best technology to make an impact locally. And after all, it's the, the local researchers who know how to actually protect and conserve different species. They're embedded there, and they're the experts. Cool. So there's obviously a lot of things for us to cover here. Um, what I guess I thought we would do was start between this interaction between Gustavo and what Jess were talking about. And so Gustavo, I was wondering if you can kind of expand on what you were talking about with this data redundancy of this satellite communication network and why that's important for the ability to track species, especially across really remote areas of the planet. No, absolutely. Um, connectivity nowadays is, is everywhere, right? I mean, we're sitting in an urban environment. It's very easy to deliver connectivity in major cities through terrestrial and mobile networks. However, if you are in areas in the middle of the ocean or in the sky in an, in, in, on an airplane, or if you're in the middle of an area where most of these species that we're trying to track are living, it's very difficult to provide connectivity. One of the big advantages that Iridium has is that we have satellites that cover 100% of the globe. And what we've seen over the last 10 years is a big evolution in terms of the, the decline in cost for the terminals that we provide uh, that access our network, as well as the, the power required. And the combination of those two allow us to provide very small modems. Uh, we work with, with partners across the globe. We have about 500 partners that sell our services, but also manufacture very small devices to be able to track, in this particular case, animal, animals. Um, and those devices, in addition to being able to send the data, they can add, they can add value with regards to sensors. That they control temperature, they control movement, they control humidity, and that information is sent from from the animal collars to a data center that is then translated into usable, actionable data. Uh, today, we are tracking animals in almost all of the continents. We're tracking elephants, we're tracking giraffes and rhinos in Africa. 
tracking, tracking jaguars in Brazil and even wildcats in nearby Virginia. Uh, and that is all possible because of the proximity of our satellites to Earth and the size of the, of, of the devices that you can build something that can actually go on an animal and provide that data that allows you, know, you guys to be able to track those animals and use that data um, to, to follow behavior, migration patterns, and the like. Yeah, and Jess, I'm wondering if you can just pick things off from there and, and talk about how this, this near real-time information that you get from these Iridium-enabled devices how is that type of information integrated into Earth Ranger? And maybe if, could you provide a few case study examples, you know, where you guys were really blown away with what you're able to do? Yeah, gladly. Uh, and, and so we're on, as as uh, as I said, we're on the receiving end of those devices and those data. So as all of that information about the uh, location of those animals or those additional parameters like the humidity and temperature, as were mentioned, uh, are sent. We receive all those data so we can then provide a singular view of where all the animals that are being tracked by an organization currently are. And by doing that, we can show not just their location, but also then provide analysis on top of that and uh, give alerts of different things as they occur. So for example, if animals have stopped moving or are moving too slowly, perhaps indicating that they're injured, um, or if uh, they, they're moving too quickly, which might indicate that a, you know, it's no longer moving on its own volition, um, then we can provide that uh, warning to rangers and, and, and to other uh, conservationists that they can intercede and protect those animals or at least respond to the situation. Um, but similarly, we protect not only the animals, but also um, local uh, people um, through similar approaches. Uh, we know if a animal, for example, has crossed a, uh, a virtual boundary called the geofence. So we know if, for example, elephants are headed towards a village and might um, be raiding a villager's crops. And so we're able to dispatch rangers to intercede before that becomes an issue for both the people and the elephants. Um, we can also support the study of animal behavior and interaction. And so some examples of all of this are in Washington State, where we're working with Panthera and a number of First Nations tribes who are studying cougar movement throughout the state um, and analyzing where they're feeding, um, where uh, they're uh, performing different behaviors throughout the course of their lifetime so that they can advocate for and basically design a transportation system working with the Washington Department of Transportation that allows for them to move safely throughout the state and not be as um, uh, threatened by road networks. Um, or the example that I just gave with the geofences and the elephants, um, that's being used now by well over 100 different national parks and reserves throughout Africa to protect villages and animals um, for elephants or lions or any sort of animals that, that might cause issue if they leave a protected area boundaries. Um, this also helps people. We, we help monitor rangers and their safety. So if we, um, there's a great example in Kenya, uh, in Mbiseli National Park, where a ranger was actually knocked unconscious by an elephant, um, but we were able to help um, the team there to locate that ranger and, and, and save that ranger's life. Um, but, and this, this applies uh, not just to, uh, to animals and people, but also to whole landscapes uh, using data like com that comes from planet uh, to analyze landscapes and see where deforestation is occurring so that can intercede in, in trees that are being cut down. Um, and so through, through I, I, we, we, we were privileged to work with so many wonderful organizations, about um, 300 of them now that are using technologies like this in lots of different ways to protect um, people and, and, and landscapes and, and animals all across the planet. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. I mean, it sounds like what you're doing is you're integrating this information to better make decisions on the ground and, uh, you know, improve the trajectory for communities and wildlife. Yeah, that's that, that's certainly our goal, and and so uh, we're we're very pleased to be working with actually all of the companies that are represented on the stage today, and really leveraging data from everywhere that we can get it uh, to pull all this together and and, and um, uh, provide a collective set of information that is way beyond what people might have without these these technologies. Yeah. So Jess, you also mentioned Planet. So let's switch over to Tanya and give her an opportunity to talk a little bit more in depth about this constellation. Now, I'm, I'm a scientist that has mostly used the, the Landsat constellation for the past 
many decades. What you're talking about is much different. Can you go into a little detail? Right, so the traditional model with something like Landsat has been a single billion dollar satellite. They launch one every decade or so to continue this record. So the program has been around for about 50 years now. Um, but you're kind of putting all your eggs in one basket and once it's launched, you can't do anything to upgrade what's up there other than you know a software patch every now and then. So the model of Planet is we build satellites that are about this big and uh, they cost probably less than some of the cars out on the streets here. And we launch them in batches. So anywhere from five to, I think the most we've done at once was 88 satellites in a single launch. And so that way, since we can build them really inexpensively and we do everything in house, we build them, we operate them, we process the imagery, and then we deliver some insights on the other end of that imagery, we can constantly iterate. So if there's some new technology that we're gonna put in or we want to change the number of spectral bands that we offer or make some other kind of improvement to the optics, we have the flexibility to do that. And so it works really well in tandem with these satellites like Landsat, which are you know, really, really powerful at a lower spatial resolution, but it is like so beautifully calibrated and it provides a lot of data that then we can use on the commercial side to make our data better so that they can work together to help us understand how the world is evolving. Yeah, I guess one of the things that I, I hear between what you and both Gustavo mentioned is redundancy between the platforms. Um, I'm wondering, I'm assuming with your satellite constellation, there was a lot of frustrations to get to the point where you are today. And I'm wondering if there is a moment that you could share with us where you in the lab, you know, members of your lab actually collected some imagery and were just blown away by what you were able to collect. Oh gosh, I think there's so many cool examples, but specific to the topic of the panel, I think we, we caught whales one time, which no one was really sure if we would be able to resolve at three to five meter resolution. But if they're close enough to the surface, you can make out some of the bigger ones. Um, but my, my favorite story is from someone that we call the walrus guy, who is a researcher at the USGS. And he's using our data to study walrus haulouts, so groups of walruses along the beaches in Alaska, where uh, they used to haul out on sea ice, but now that sea ice is diminishing due to climate change, they're coming on shore much more frequently. And it's a problem because if they're somewhere near where there's human activity, if you have a boat that comes by too closely, or a drone or an airplane that flies overhead too closely, that sound can scare the walruses and they'll stampede back into the water and they end up trampling over each other and a lot of them will die in this process. And so this researcher was using our data to figure out where are the walruses in real time so that he could issue alerts to say, hey, there are walruses on this beach. Don't fly planes within you know, 50 kilometers or whatever. Don't have any boats go in this zone. So to see something where we could directly tell where animals were and do something to try and protect them was really amazing. And I, I think he's one of our favorite kind of success stories within Planet. And I think we were also just blown away to know that you could, we can't resolve individual wal walruses with our imagery, but walruses are so big that you can see the color difference between a patch of walruses on a beach and an empty beach. And there's a lot of other uh, examples of that. We can't generally see individual animals with, with the exception of these giant whales, but we can see the effects that these animals have on the ecosystems. So places where you might have, um, in Antarctica, for example, you can see where penguins have pooped all over rocks, but you can't see the penguins themselves. Or there are places across uh, different parts of Africa where you can see where um, certain animals have eaten their way across the landscape, and you can see the, the line of where they were move over time. So any of that kind of stuff where we can actually see what the animals are doing in near real time from space is just really cool. Yeah, I remember looking at the, the line of wildebeest, not seeing the wildebeest, but actually seeing the grassland actually being removed like it was a, a row of fire that was actually just moving across. For me, that was certainly an aha moment. I'm wondering just for everyone here, if you could just talk about what resolution are we talking about with, with Planet? So for the daily scan, it's three to five meters. Um, I put that in perspective to resolve something in satellite image, it needs to to be three pixels in any dimension. If you get below that, you start getting into that realm of conspiracy theorists who think they're finding alien bases on the moon. So don't do that. It means that we can resolve things that are about nine to 15 meters in size on the ground. So you need things that are like bigger than a truck or a school bus to really be able to see them. 
So how about we transition one more and provide a, a different perspective and give Jason an opportunity to talk about Wild Me and some of the projects that you're working on? Sure. So um, one of the places I like to start with describing what Wild Me does is this question of what does it mean to be endangered? We use that word a lot, but understanding the, the scale of that, how endangered, is the animal about to disappear? Are they in a slow decline? That's up to a lot of different field researchers who are collecting data. And an interesting thing about the work we do is that we work with researchers who are studying individual animals through this technique called marker capture. They're literally trying to learn you know, every zebra, every giraffe, every little leafy and weedy sea dragon in their population, and they've got to find a way to tell them apart. Well, we as humans are really good about telling apart faces, for example, or haircuts and things like that. But we need, a, a researcher is, has to learn how to tell different lions apart, different zebras apart by their stripes. Before machine learning and AI, this was done visually, and the human brain is still one of the best computers I've ever bumped into. But we provide uh, machine learning and AI that help researchers take large volumes of photographs, which is really where we are in data collection these days. Photographs are among the cheapest and most available forms of data of wildlife that we can find. And a lot of researchers are getting behind in processing their data. And what they're really doing is going through large volumes of photographs, trying to figure out which zebra is this, which zebra is this. And it gets really complex, because your photograph might be a herd of zebras. So now you've got you know, over one photograph, you've got 20 decisions that you have to make. So this is where machine learning can be a really good assistant. Come in, learn how to distinguish different zebras by their stripes, and help researchers get through large volumes of photographs to count their animals. And this can be anything from the Great Grevy's Rally, where we send out hundreds of individuals to take tens of thousands of photographs and really try to count every zebra in the local population, all the way down to these marker capture studies where we're just subsampling the population and trying to build statistical models. At the end of the day, when we talk about this word endangered, though, what my team is doing is trying to apply AI to help on-site researchers come up with population estimates. You know, how many animals do we have? And is that changing over time? Is it getting worse or better? And then they use that data to walk over to the management authority, the local government authority, and say, hey, we need to change. We need better protection. And because they have this data behind them, they are, can be much more effective in that communication. So is WildMe just for researchers, or is there a way to get this army of citizen scientists involved in contributing photos if they're on safari? Is that possible? Oh, absolutely. Um, and it, there, there are different ways to engage with our technology, and this is where AI gets sometimes a little bit weird. So most of the time what we do is we support researchers directly. Because when we collect data and we process this data, we need we need a local partner who can make sense of it, make it effective, and you know, lobby for change. So we want to start with a local conservation organization or researcher to make sure that somebody's going to do something with this data that's positive. And then after that, we can build layers on top of data collection. We can work with citizen scientists, tourists, people on safari, scuba divers seeing whale sharks, to collect all their photographs, the date and location they saw the animal, run it through the AI, which will then find each animal in the photograph, and try to suggest different individual IDs. Much like you can think of the FBI trying to find you know, faces off of license or uh, your driver's license, we do that for stripes and spots and the jagged edges of dolphin fish. And so that we, the, the AI helps the researchers scale to the point where they can get this volume of photography from citizen science and make sense of it. And then with more data, they're able to run much more sophisticated statistical models and come up with better population estimates that help them justify change. But then we can get into the world of, well, OK, we've been talking about human researchers, scientists, citizen scientists. What about non-human researchers? So one of the experiments we ran was this YouTube, what we call uh, intelligent agent. And we took multiple forms of artificial intelligence, computer vision to find animals in YouTube videos, machine learning to read the text of YouTube videos and even look for dates and locations embedded in the video, machine translation to take all those YouTube video descriptions and translate them to English to then put them in machine learning. And what we created in our SharkBook platform is a non-human actor. We created a researcher who reads, watches videos, and makes decisions to curate data. And that agent, with all those different forms, natural language processing, computer vision, was embedded in the multiple hundreds of 
human researchers in our Sharkbook platform. And what it did is it just sat there and listened and watched YouTube for 24, every 24 hours, found videos, took all the text, read it, made a snap decision about whether this describes a whale shark in the aquarium or a whale shark in the wild. And if it was a whale shark in the wild, then it began going through all the different frames, finding frames of whale sharks, trying to predict the date and location based out of the description. And if it had a photograph or a frame from the video, a date and a location, it had a data point. And what we found is this non-human actor actually flooded us. It collected more data about whale sharks than the entire human research community combined. It found a lot of cruft. Um, it found season one, episode one of the Octonauts, which is about a whale shark. Um, but it found a lot of data. So your average human researcher, the data they collect, about 75% of the time, we can figure out which animal it is. For, for the intelligent agent, it was only about 30%. And yet it collected so much more data that it effectively outpaced every human. We actually, at some point, had to turn it off because the humans couldn't keep up with this agent. Now, what's interesting about this intelligent agent is it actually goes to where people are. As a nonprofit, I have a budget, and there's only so much time I can spend in outreach. And oftentimes, I just reach the same people, people interested in conservation. But an intelligent agent goes to social media. It finds people I never collect with. And it has this ability to sort of leapfrog over all my barriers and engage with people who don't even know about us, who don't know that their vacation video of a whale shark actually matched another whale shark. And a great example, of, you know, circling back to the concept of citizen science, we recently were able to see a connection between the Cocos Islands and the Galapagos, and it was because of a vacation video that connected with a piece of Galapagos data. And so it's that kind of um, effect of, of a researcher, citizen scientist, and an intelligent agent going through video where we really build these communities around the technology. Yeah, so I have about 101 questions about all the data that you all are collecting. But I'm wondering if first we can just open this up for questions from, from all of you. So if you have a burning question, I would invite you to step up to the mic and speak your question clearly so that it can be recorded. If there's no questions, I'm, I have, I'm happy to fill the space. What you're saying, that sounds like almost too much data. Like, when is it too much data? And how much time are you spending sifting through it? So do you need a human to go through and take out all of the irrelevant data? And I'm just thinking about in terms of like improvement and efficiency. Where, what, where are you going with it? Is, is that a question for me? Yes. OK. Um, yes. And uh, again, to start getting into the, the weird world, of what does an individual ID mean? So we can collect this very, very large volume of data now. And humans are still humans, and they still have really high performance brains. And they want to be able to review all that for accuracy. And so in our newer machine learning software, we actually went from full automation, where the system can make all, you know, from start to finish, we can make a decision. And that really scales well with that large volume of data, to actually putting the human back in the loop to review decisions made by ML before we go on to the next set of decisions. That's going to be a scalability hit. That's going to slow us down a little bit, but it will help build confidence that the machine learning is doing what it needs to do. But there is this question, and I literally had a biologist jump out of his seat but, and say when I described this, this next process, that we're, we're not putting any biologists out of jobs. Don't worry. It, it was the idea that, well, this concept of deciding who's who in an animal population, what if we left that up to the machines? What if in a cloud of 50,000 zebra photographs, we could have AI navigate through all the different photographs and create the path through time of each zebra, just going through this cloud by data mining the pairwise relationships between all the photographs? What if there were no human decisions in figuring out how many Grevy zebra do we have? Well, now we're talking about a weird world of virtual zebras and population estimates. But if that can be baselined to show that it's as accurate or more accurate and more scalable, then we've really stepped into this weird world where we have highly accurate data. And we need to keep checking it for biases. But we're leaving decisions up to the machines. And that we're still processing. We have that technology now, and we're still processing how to deploy it and get, more importantly, get trust in it. I think touching on the idea of like what is too much data, 
the key for training all of these machine learning algorithms is having a lot of input data to start with. So it's a little bit of a catch-22. Like you need a ton of data to have a good model. But yeah, is there a point where like, what do you, where do you store all of this data? What, we, what do you do with it? Certainly, I, I don't know what kind of data volumes you guys are dealing with, but for Planet, we're collecting 25 terabytes a day. And that means our Google Cloud storage bill is immense. <laughs> and the, so the question is, you know, do you need to image the whole world every day? And honestly, some of our competitors have asked this question. And, and the answer is, well, we, we don't know what we don't see. So if we're not looking for these things, we might be missing something really important. So I don't know if there's ever, like from a scientific standpoint, too much data, um, but it is a lot to go through for sure. Well, just to add to that. Wait a minute. Sorry. How about we have Gustavo go first, and yeah. then Jess will have you follow up. J just to add to that, we recently introduced cloud services. So the data that we, you know, we transmit from transmit from some of our partners that are on the animals is going to the cloud, uh, and the cloud is just booming, right? I mean, a lot of the data we're meeting our customers at the cloud, and there's a lot of investment going into the cloud. And there's a lot of analytical tools going into the cloud. So I think the more data you have to be able to sort through and make make it intelligent and make it actionable data, I think the better. Jess? And the flip side of this also is that um, these tools are also really useful for finding the right data. So prior to uh, the AI and ML boom, um, somewhat recent boom, uh, the, and then after all of these remote sensing technologies became available, um, the scientific world was flooded with camera trap imagery, uh, you have cameras that automatically take photos when there's movement or video imagery from different places. Um, the YouTube example is an interesting one because people have basically already curated all of that content down to only what's interesting and posted that on YouTube. But the problem before that was that there was so much data that wasn't interesting, um, you know, swaying grass in the wind that would cause cameras to trip or, or whatnot. And so uh, tools like WildMe um, have allowed for massive amounts of data to be curated into what's really important also. And so, yes, uh, there's a lot of data being collected, but it's also a subset of all of the sensor information that's out there and thankfully distilled to what's actually useful. I think one of the really interesting things sort of feeding on this, is there too much data? AI and ML are forcing us to figure out what is good data anymore. And I'll so, just say ML is machine learning. And uh, so, so I was, you know, Jess was talking about camera traps. We recently had a photograph in our African Carnivore Wild Book where in the camera trap it was just the tail of the cheetah. No body, no spots on the body, no face, just the tail. In the old world, we would have thrown that data out. That's bad data. It's a poor camera trap photograph. Our bad, you know, let's go on to the next set of photographs. In this case, our machine learning algorithm identified the cheetah based on the tail pattern. Just, and it correctly pointed out, this is that cheetah. So in this large volume of data, the whole sense of, well, what is good data and bad data anymore is also really challenging for us because we're finding the AI and ML are exceeding our expectations and, and forcing us to rethink our data collection and analysis as well. So it's this a little bit of a vicious circle as the technology rapidly advances and we try to figure out how good it is. And that's one of the challenges I think we have as technologists is taking all of those data and presenting to the actual users and the people who can benefit from this information what's important to them so that uh, decisions can ultimately be made. Yeah, so just, just to touch on that, so we're all data scientists here, and we're talking about oodles and oodles of data. So how do we make sure that this, this information actually is getting into the right hands, that it's actually being used for good, for communities, for wildlife, for actually, you know, saving the planet? Uh, so, strike to me, Jared. It, yeah, we'll start with you. Okay. All right. Uh, well, I, I think there's... There's, there's so many different ways that these data can be used to make uh, a huge difference. If you, if you think of, and you know, just pick any protected area in Africa, I tend to go back to that because that's where I spend most of my time uh, working with people, is uh, data can be used to help uh, protect communities. It can be used to help uh, optimize populations of wildlife. It can be used to help optimize uh, revenues that are coming in from carbon credit uh, mechanisms. Um, the, the same data and the same approaches can be used for many, many different purposes. Um, I, I, our, our personal belief is that uh, the more access that people can have to their data, the more that they can do with it, the better decisions that can be made. Um, we also encourage 
uh, organizations as much as uh, can reasonably be done bearing security in mind um, to work with neighboring and like-minded organizations who can also benefit from those same data. Uh, so uh, examples might be a, um, an organization that is tracking uh, elephant populations across large landscapes. Um, the Mar Elephant Project is, uh, has a booth somewhere at the festival, I know. Um, they shared their elephant movement data with the Kenya Wildlife Service, who also has the charter for the protection of the animals throughout the country. Um, so even though that data was being collected by one organization, it can benefit many. That same data can also then be used by academics. Uh, we, we actually have an intern that just used some of the same data sets to try to predict the, uh, some of the behavior of the elephants based on their movement patterns. And therefore, what, um, you know, what stage of uh, um, the cycle, hormonal cycle uh, elephants are in or what their, what their current um, uh, interests are. Uh, and so the, the same data that's being collected by any one of these sensors can aid um, commercial purposes, academic purposes, uh, conservation and security purposes, and as long as it's done in a thoughtful manner that keeps data secure when it needs to be, uh, we, we believe that this benefits everyone. Yeah, just thanks for connecting the dots. Um, I think we're going to have to cut it short there, so we're coming to the end of our session. Um, but if you have additional questions for any of our panelists, um, all of us are going to be um, hanging out after the session, and so please, you know, feel 